Our text for this afternoon is found in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 5. In his uh, planning for our service today, Magnus has chosen some very appropriate scripture texts and hymns that really bring us to the theme that we would like to underscore today, which we might uh, call peril and confidence face to face. The reason for this being that we find in Ezra chapter 5 and 6 a situation that is very much like what we have seen so far. But there's a slight nuance that I want us to detect, and I hope you'll pick up on it. Um, I don't know if you like reading legal documents, <laughs> especially in a language you don't master. Isn't it fun if you've just arrived in Spain and you decide you're going to redo your will? You go see a lawyer, and the lawyer speaks reasonably good English, and you say, well, I want this and this and this provision, and you, you go back a second time, and he gives you a document, all in Spanish, of course, because your will has to be written in Spanish for it to have legal punch in this country. And you look at the document, even if you are reasonably good uh, extranjero, and you understand, you know, um, the basic vocabulary but the special language, well, it's just not fun to read a legal document. Even in your mother tongue. Because it goes on and on and on. And multiplies synonyms just to cover all the bases. Don't be intimidated by this passage. It does have a legal document in it. But I think you're going to find it quite easy to follow. There's not a lot of technical language. In fact, it's a very exciting legal document to read because you're going to see how relevant it is to the problems that the Jewish regions <coughs> from Babylon face. If we know God to be who he says he is and who he really is, it's going to make a big difference when we go, go eyeball to eyeball with the danger of a legal document. Now, if you have been with us <clears throat> for the whole journey through the book of Ezra so far, and we're about halfway through this Old Testament historical narrative, um, maybe you can answer some of these questions. This is kind of a um, half-semester quiz. I, I know they don't give tests. Uh, on sermons, but let's just use it as a means to review where we've been because uh, some of us have not been here the whole time. Um, I'll give you the question and you don't have to raise your hand. You can just uh, call out the answer if you know it. Okay? Are you in agreement with this? Can we, can we handle this? Uh, here's the first question. What was the name of the first king of Persia whose name God re revealed to the prophet Isaiah a couple hundred years before the king's birth. Asa, did you say? I, I, I can't hear you. I'm uh, 70. Ataxes. No, not Ataxes. No, it was not Ataxes. That is later on. Someone called out Cyrus. Cyrus, king of Persia, that's the correct answer. Chapter 1 of Ezra and verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. Question number 2. What did the king decree in the first year of his reign? Short phrase or sentence? You can cheat. Look at verse 2 of chapter 1. Rebuild the house in Jerusalem. Rebuild the house in Jerusalem. Yeah, it says, Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, 
The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Of course, you remember that the temple of Solomon, the house of Jehovah, had been destroyed by the Babylonians about 70 years earlier. Question number three. About how many Jewish people returned from Babylon to Judah to rebuild the temple? Now, if you can't get this, don't feel badly because I didn't remember the number either. Can you give a kind of rough guess? 50,000. 50,000? Yeah, that's in the territory. Look at chapter 2, verse 64 and 65. The whole congregation together was 40 and 2,000, 303 score, beside their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,337. That's pretty precise counting. And there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. So we're talking about in the neighborhood of 50,000. Which means that there were many Jewish people who decided to stay where they were. Thank you very much. This required a lot of effort. Question number four. What was the first thing the returning Jewish community built on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? What was the first thing that they built? An altar. An altar, correct, chapter 3, verse 2. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon. First thing that's built is the altar. Now, of course, they also place down the foundations. What two emotions did the Jewish people express when the temple foundations were laid? Yeah. What two emotions did the Jewish people express when the temple foundations were laid? Praise. Praise is one. Prostitute. Okay, praise, gratitude, on the positive side. Silence. Thanks. Silence. They sang. Okay, but that's not really an emotion. I'm looking for an emotion here. Regret. Regret, yes, sadness. Chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. They sang together by course in prayer, in, sorry, in praising and, thank, and giving of thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. There you've got the positive side. Wow, what a great moment. But, verse 12, many of the priests and Levites and chiefs of the fathers who were ancient men, uh, uh, we use the word ancient in a slightly different way, they were elderly, really old men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. So you've got joy and sadness uh, juxtaposed, these two emotions side by side. Three other questions. What strategy did the enemies of Judah first take to stop the building? A little louder. Let's do it together. Right. Chapter 4, verse 2. Then stood up Jesh, Jesh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 3 here. I want to be in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 2. Then they came in, uh, sorry, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Ashur, uh, which brought us up hither. Let's have some ecumenical cooperation. And of course we know that this was refused uh, with great wisdom because this was just a trick by the enemies of the project. For about how long did the enemies of Israel manage to stop the rebuilding of the temple?
A year? Two? Fourteen years. Fourteen? Fifteen? Seventeen? Seventeen. About seventeen years, things came to a grinding halt. We can see this when we compare the dates in chapter 4, verse 24, with the other dates that are given to us in the account. Last question. How did God revive the stalled project? <coughs> what means did he use? Two, two prophets, particularly, whose names were? Haggai and Zechariah. That's right. And the prophets came to them and said, and we read it last time in Haggai, folks, it's time to stop making excuses. Um, you have plenty of time for your paneled houses. Let's get back to work. And so that is where we are in the account. You, you've done well. And it's important for us to remember these things because we only have once a month to uh, focus on Ezra. And uh, if you are like me, and most of you look about my age or more, uh, these things disappear into the cobwebs of the brain uh, very quickly. I hope now that this whole story is becoming familiar territory to you and um, that you can sense some of the motivation of these Jewish people returned from the Babylon exile to rebuild Solomon's fallen house of God. And we've tried to suggest a parallel. Uh, the church does not replace Israel, but in many ways there are similarities between God's program for Israel and God's program for the church. And right now, in God's plan, the church is the place that is God's building. He dwells in the church, the, the, not in the building, but in his people. And he also, by his spirit, lives in uh, the individual Christian. He has come to indwell us and uh, to make our body his, his dwelling place. Now let's go on to this afternoon's text. If I were to pick out a few key themes in these two chapters, chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. The two words that I would pick out of the text are eyes, E-Y-E-S, and names. Eyes and names. As we move along through the reading, I think you'll see why I would pick these out. Let's begin our reading in Ezra chapter 5, verse 3, and we'll just read the first two verses of our text, verses 3 and 4, which are all about uh, little threatening eyes and little names. Ezra 5, 3, at the same time came to them Tatnai, the governor on this side of the river, and Shetar Bosnai, and their companions, and said thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house, and to make up this wall? Then said we unto them, after this manner, What are the names of the men that make this building? Now, there's a question here in the intent. It seems that verse 4 actually is a question that is posed to the leadership of Israel about who are the men who are responsible for the building project. Now, I want you to try to put your, yourself in the situation. Zerubbabel, who is the governor and who is of the royal Davidic line, and his colleague, Yeshua, the high priest, they are leading the rest of the workers in the building project. And uh, they're gathering materials now for the continuation of building the walls and building the roof. There are timbers to be gathered. This is a huge project. Nebuchadnezzar had burned down Solomon's first great temple, and he had pulled apart the cracked stones and now we're about 100 years later, and the materials that are on the Temple Mount, the rubble lying around, 
is, is really just rubble. They're going to have to make some new stones. They're going to have to be quarried somewhere. Big stones. They have imported cypress wood from the country of Lebanon, and this not need, now needs to be used. They've certainly tried out it nicely after 17 years. I don't know if you've ever built anything with wood, but uh, make sure that it's dried before you start constructing anything. And so you can imagine the, the building squads on the location. They're well organized, they're enthusiastic about the renewal of their mission. They've been listening to Haggai and Zachariah. They're busy as bees on the Temple Mount. In the morning sunshine, and uh, Zerubbabel is looking over maybe some drawings with the chief architects. When a servant runs up, and uh, he's breathless with the news, Zerubbabel, sir, uh, there's some people here uh, to see you, some men coming up to the Temple Mount, sir. They, they want to talk to you. They have been sent by the Persian satrap. to tell you they don't look too happy. You, you need to be ready to speak to them. So who are these two people? They are identified in our text as Tatnai and Shethbar Bosnai. Quite the handles. I, I don't <coughs> necessarily recommend that you use these names to name your children or grandchildren. Not anymore. Who are these men? Tatnai is identified as the governor on this side of the river. He, he has uh, more than just local control. This man is a person who directly answers to one of the uh, dozen or so powerful satraps in the Persian Empire. The satraps were very powerful people of the royal family, noblemen, who were appointed for life directly by the king to rule a satrapy, which was a province. And so Tatanai was directly responsible to the governor of the large province. These people were tax collectors. In the United States, you would call this a member of the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. What do they call them in Spain? La Hacienda. La Hacienda. La Hacienda. Uh, yeah. Don't you like to have a visit from a person like that, knocking on your door? You say, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Because obviously they're not there to tell you the latest football scores. And then you have his sidekick, Shetan Botsanai. And he, whose name means Star of Splendor, is probably a government investigator, probably a person with a little less clout than Tatanai himself. And notice that they're really not all alone, because the text tells us that there are others with them. Their companions are listed, their colleagues their compañeros de trabajo. So this is a little group that comes up to the Temple Mountain to, to do a friendly interview. What do they want? For that matter, how did they get wind of the relaunch of the building project after these years? Was it the, the local Sumerians, the opponents of the Jews, who put him up to this friendly governmental visit? text doesn't tell us. We don't know where they got the information. But it's clear that he was coming neither to encourage the Jews nor to assassinate them. There is a slightly different strategy that appears to be coming in. It looks like the enemies of the Jews have engaged the local authorities to come in and bring in some legal intimidation. And so the question is, who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and finish this structure? Have you ever been driving down the road? Um, you know from your speedometer that you've been playing just a little bit with the speed limit. You're not 
way over, but a little margin of error. And you see blue light flashing behind you, and you have to be pulled over, and the policeman, the Guardia Civil, or some other policeman, uh, asks you to roll down your window, push the electric button, and says, may I have your papers, please? I would see your driver's license. But what kind of emotions do you feel? I suppose it depends on what you've been doing in your car. But if you've been even driving under the speed limit, you probably feel just a little bit intimidated. What, what's going on? What does he want with me? You know, I'm, I'm innocent, right, officer? There is an intimidation factor because the man wears a high cap and he has black boots on and maybe, you know, one of these very black uniforms and uh, maybe he even has a, a gun on him. And so you're a little nervous. And then um, it appears in chapter 5, verse 10, that it is the government officials who have asked for the names of the people. Because it says in verse 10, we ask their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. So um, there's an intimidation factor. We, we want to have a whole list of names of the, over, the overseers of your project, all the workers, give us names and addresses. We want their iPhone uh, numbers, you know, that, what, what, where are they on WhatsApp? I think the emotion, the response, was designed for the intimidation. This is a dramatic situation. There are lots of little beady eyes that are staring down Zerubbabel and Joshua and the workers. And the names are listed carefully. They're written down on the Persian's clay notebook. It's incriminating evidence, maybe, for a thorough government investigation. And the rest of the section, from here in chapter 5, all the way through chapter 6, tells us the results of the investigation. Now, before we read, chapter 5, verse 5, to chapter 6, verse 12. Think a moment about a situation in modern Europe that might involve intimidation for your faith. Or your convictions uh, that have to do with practice. These things are common. They're not as difficult to deal with in Western Europe yet, as they are in many other countries where there is open persecution of the Christian faith. But this is something that our young people deal with. I thought of this example. Some years ago, our son, who was our third child, when he was in his secondary education, was taking an English literature class. And he was required in this class by the professor to read a novel which was inappropriate, to say the least. This happens all the time, of course, in English literature classes. And I think that English lit teachers can sometimes be the most politically oriented and aggressive in their stance against the Christian faith. We discovered what the contents were of that book because there was a friend of ours from the UK who was visiting us and who was an English lit teacher. And we had that book on the coffee table and he picked it up and he says, what's this? And he said, well, that's the book that Nathan has to read. Oh, he said, look at this. And so I looked at that. I don't want my son reading that book. So we decided that we make an appointment with a professor who had done his doctoral work on Immanuel Kant and the whole trend of um, post-modernity that followed Kant's epistemology. And uh, we asked to meet with him, and the principal of the school was there. Uh, our son was not present, so it was just the three of us men. And I said to the professor, why did you choose this particular novel? for the class, when it is clearly pornographic, 
and promotes the homosexual agenda and a view of truth that is uh, very politically oriented. He said, I don't believe that this reading material is beneficial in any way. There are hundreds of other, thousands of other books that you could have chosen instead of this one from all of the books that are approved for the English literature class in this particular um, baccalaureate series of studies. I would like to propose, I said that Nathan be allowed to read an alternative novel that would be taken from the list of books that are approved in the International Baccalaureate. And he said, uh, Mr. Hireman, he said, uh, you are the only person with one possible exception who has ever protested against my choices for reading material in this English literature class. And I've been teaching for X number of years. And I'm not going to withdraw the book. So what would you have done? Get a bigger stick. Sorry? Get a bigger stick. Get a bigger stick. <laughs> well, uh, when you're right there in the situation, when Zerubbabel and Joshua are in front of these two Persians and their secretaries, you have to make a sound decision, right? And you don't always have a lot of time to think about it. And so I took a risk and I said, well, <clears throat> I guess Nathan will have to fail the class because I don't want him to read this book. And that was kind of the end of the discussion. The principal, after the confrontation, took me aside and said, uh, I understand your point of view. It's clear that he had to support his professor. He said, um, have you ever read C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man? I said, yes, I have. He just kind of gave me a little wink, as if to say, I understand the problem you have. Um, in the end, I don't really know that Nathan <clears throat> failed that class. He ended up graduating second in his class. It was at the end of his academic career. But it was an intimidating situation. And that was an easy one. Because today, our young people are facing things that are far more difficult to manage. And the woke agenda, and the political and news speak that our young people have to face, even <clears throat> children in the primary ages, have to deal with intimidation. This is the kind of situation that they face every day. Now, maybe you don't have children that age, but maybe you have grandchildren. And if they don't know the Lord, they are very largely disarmed. If they do know Christ, we need to pray for them and encourage them because these kinds of dynamics are going to be repeated more and more unless God in his gracious, gracious uh, mercy turns our society around. And these kinds of things happen in the workplace. <laughs> Uh, diversity classes, you know, every every worker in every institution now, if you want to have a certain ESG score, you must be willing to take a class in um, diversity and inclusion and those kinds of things. Or there are pressures to cheat and sale. Well, we could multiply the examples where a Christian is intimidated by the suggestion, by the threat of consequences if he does not budge. Little beady eyes and a list of names. Now I want you to see the contrast in the next section, which is the remainder of our text for this afternoon. <clears throat> Chapter 5, beginning our reading in verse 5, and I'm going to read all the way through the verses that remain in our text, and then we'll make some observations about this. Verse 5, but the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them, that is, that, rep that representatives of the Persian government could not cause the Jews to cease, till the matter came 
to Darius. And then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. Now here's the legal document, okay? The copy of a letter that Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, and Shetar Bosnai and his companions, the Afarsakites, which were on this side of the river. This river, by the way, is the Euphrates, not the Jordan, the Euphrates River. Sent unto Darius the king. They sent a letter unto him, wherein was written thus. Unto Darius the king, all peace, be it known unto the king that we went into the province of Judea, to the house of the great God, which is builded with great stones, and timber is laid in the walls, and this work goeth fast on, and prospereth in their hands. Then asked we those elders, and said unto them thus, Who commanded you to build this house, and to make up these walls? We asked their names also, to certify thee, that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. <clears throat> and thus they returned us answer, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and build the house that was building these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. But after that our fathers had provoked the God of heaven unto wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king Cyrus made a decree to build this house of God. And the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought them into the temple of Babylon, those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor, that is the same as Zerubbabel, and said unto him, Take these vessels, go carry them into the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be builded in his place. Then came the same Sheshbazar and laid the foundation of the house of God which is in Jerusalem, and since that time, even until now, hath it been in building, and yet it is not finished. There's a slight exaggeration there because of that in the building process for that whole 17 years. Now therefore, if it seem good to the king, let there be search made in the king's treasure house, which is there at Babylon, whether it be so, that a decree was made. That is, is it really true that a decree was made of Cyrus the king to build this house of God at Jerusalem? And let the king send his pleasure to us concerning this matter. And then Darius the king made a decree. And search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Akmeta, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll. And therein was a record thus written. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be built the place where they offer sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof threescore cubits, with three rows of great stones, and a row of new timber, and let the expenses be given out of the king's house, and also let the golden and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple which is at Jerusalem, and brought unto Babylon, be restored, and brought again into the temple which is at Jerusalem, every one to his place, and placed them in the house of God. Now therefore, Tatnai, governor beyond the river, Sheter Bosnai, and your companions, the Afarsakites, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. In other words, get out of the way. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God. That of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith 
expenses be given unto these men that they be not hindered. And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priests which are in Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of the sons. Also I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and all people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree, let it be done with speed. Rapido. Now that's a surprise, that passage. I hope you say, wow, this is not what I expected. Here again, I want you to look at the I and the names. Because although there were lots of beady eyes looking at the Jews, asking for the names of the men who were working on the project, there is another I in the text that is far superior. And he has great names that are far superior to all the sophisticated names of these Persian officials. Think about God's great caring eye that is mentioned in verse 5. The eye of their God was upon them, upon the elders of the Jews. How so? Well, first of all, I think we see that the eye of God was upon this project because the officials who came in there with a very aggressive posture did not tell the Jews to stop the work. They didn't say, halt, until we get word from the king, you're not allowed to do anything here. They didn't say that. And had they done so, this would have been a far more difficult project because they could have stopped the work and then taken a couple of years to write the letter and say, well, you know, it's been bogged down. I mean, after all, it's COVID. Things go very slowly, you know, with the administration these days. The eye of God was upon the project and the, the, the work continued while the wheels of Persian justice slowly turned. And secondly, God's eye was on the project because he guided the rest of the process in the remainder of chapter 5 and the first half of chapter 6 in this official correspondence. Behind this sending of a letter and receiving of a response is an invisible but all-powerful God that directs the affairs of his people who at the moment were walking with their God in obedience. Now, when I read verse 5 and, and notice the reference to the eye of God, I ask myself the question, why is God's eye any protection? Because eyes are for seeing, right? You can watch what's going on without being able to intervene. But you see, God's eye refers to his omniscience. He knows where this is going to go. <clears throat> and he is guiding the events. Theologians work to try to find a shorthand word to talk about God's ability to know everything that can be known. He knows not only what has happened in the past, he knows also what will happen in the future, and he knows everything that could happen and knows all of the possible chess moves on an infinitely large chessboard. He is even superior to AI. That is God's eye on the situation. This is called 
in the language of the seminarians and anthropomorphism. We'll talk about those in the Christian Growth Seminar in the coming weeks, God willing. And anthropomorphism, it's a fancy word that puts together anthropos, man, and morphe, shape. God expresses himself within a human shape and a human form. So the eye of God is not literally referring to an eye that God has, but it is expressing a truth about God that he sees everything that's going on. As it are the references to his arm, the, the strong arm of God. God does not have an arm. He is not literally in heaven as a, a man with a body. The Son of God now has a body, but God in his essence is not restricted to a human body. But we understand that the, the strong arm refers to the power of God. So his eye that sees all the events and his strong arm refer to his knowledge of the events and his ability to perform his will. And the eye of faith remembers that God's eye sees us. When we look at the God who cannot be seen, we realize that the God who cannot be seen sees us and watches over us, even through unexpected circumstances. Turn for just a moment to Psalm 33. This is a great comparative passage. Psalm 33, verses 13 to 20. Psalm 33, verse 13. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king save by the multitude of an host, that is, an army. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them. That is, the kings, his armies, his horses. And furthermore, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. And here's the response in verse 20. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. God's eye is our recourse when we are threatened. You say, well, those are nice words. But Tim, it's, it's a little bit naive, isn't it? To think that we can actually live that way? Humanly speaking, yes. But that's what faith is about. We trust in a God who has revealed himself in Scripture, progressively over 1,400 years, with perfect internal coherence, he has sent his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die as a sacrifice for us once for all, to be buried, to be raised again the third day, to be seen by many at different locations who did not believe in his resurrection and did not expect it. He was uh, taken up, ascended into heaven, and since then has been creating his church. And that is the God who still has his eye on us. When was the last time that you could recognize God's infinite knowledge and wisdom guiding you through rough waters? Now all of us have times when water gets white right, and choppy. And we say, oh, is, is God still there? There are times when you can't see God obviously working things out for you, and you may feel very intimidated and challenged by people who say, you're just crazy to believe in this book. You're just one of those wacko religious cult followers. And then we have to decide if we're going to trust in God's eye, because behind God's eye stands the living God. 
And sometimes it's helpful for us to take a moment and look back at how God has brought us this far when we're hitting the choppy water. And we can thank him and praise him for the way that he has done this and trust him to continue to guide us and lead us when we're facing that intimidating set of circumstances. But it's not just God's eye that looks over the little beady eyes of the intimidators, it's also his name and his multiple names that I find very striking in the, this section we just finished reading. Because it's, it's a section with lots of names in it. You have the names of the Jewish builders, the leaders. You have the names of the Persian officials. And then you have multiplied names for God himself. Not so much in what the Jews say, but also in what Darius the king says in his response. So remember that most of the passage is not written in Hebrew, it's written in Aramaic, which is kind of the trade language of the day, much like Latin was a trade language, or Koine Greek was a, a trade language in the New Testament era. Aramaic was the trade language of the ancient world in the times of, of these um, kings several hundred years uh, before Christ. And um, we have a letter written by people who wrote Aramaic, and they refer to the God of these Jewish workers. And Darius writes back, and he refers to the God of these Jewish workers. And I, I hope you noticed how they refer to Jehovah mm -hmm. in their correspondence. Yeah. I don't know if this would if this would happen in letters of complaint by Spanish officials to the government about the activities of a local church. It might, but I find this very striking. Um, look, for example, at chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, where we find references to the great God. Uh, verse 8, be it known unto the king that we went into the province of Judea to the house of the great God. And there's a reference there to the, to the walls of his house. This is one of the, the, the standard Aramaic uh, ways of speaking about a chief God. I need to understand how secular people, well, I guess the word secular is not the right word to use here. Um, Pagan people, non-Jewish people, Gentile peoples in those days thought about gods. There were main cities, and all of them, of course, had temples to the gods that were worshipped in that city. And there was often a hierarchy of gods. So you had little gods and you had big gods, and the really big names were people like Baal and Ashtoreth and those kinds of things. Jerusalem had, from their perspective, a great God, a chief God. But of course we know, when we read the scripture, that the God of Jerusalem was the great God. He really was the chief God. In fact, there are no other real gods beside him. He is really the great God. And so this is almost ironic when we read it. And the people who served the great God were working with great care. That is, with all diligence. <coughs> I think about um, how you think about God. Do you have a God who's kind of a pequeño, you know, kind of a little, little God? Lots of people worship little gods. They might have an idol on their shelf. Or maybe it's their bank account or their education, or a new car, or something else, and they think it's a great God. And they will diligently work for their gods, their false gods. We have a really great God, and if, if we really believe it, we're going to be diligent in working for him. Amen. The other name that we find here, or one of the four names that we find here is the great God of heaven, or the God of heaven and earth. You see it in chapter 5, verse 12. After that, our fathers had provoked the God of heaven. This is the report of the Jews. 
After that, our fathers had provoked the God of heaven unto wrath. Then these certain things happened. You see it uh, also in chapter 6, verse 9, in Darius' response. Uh, everything that they need for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven. Also in chapter 6, verse 10, he's referred to as the God of heaven. This is the term that uh, Darius the king uses for Jehovah God. The God over heaven and earth. He just happens to have made the universe. That's quite a boss to work for. He is greater than the elite of today's society who pretend to know how to run the world. He is greater than Cyrus and Darius I. He is at the absolute top. And we see this echoed as well in Psalm 33 earlier in the psalm. Go back, if you can, to Psalm 33 and look at verse 6, which says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsels of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The God of heaven. What are the names of God in this text? You know, Haggai referred to the God of heaven in chapter 2 when he spoke about the God who was going to shake the heavens and the earth. The day is going to come when God, who made the heavens and made the earth, is going to speak the word, and the whole thing is going to come apart at the seams. How many of you have ever lived in an earthquake? This is earthquake territory, I'm told. I don't know if there's been any significant uh, rattling around here. Kathy and I experienced an earthquake in Luxembourg, which um, toppled a couple of chimney pots. And uh, we had an old bed in those early days, in the late 70s. And we woke up in the, in the middle of the night, and we kind of bounced around and swung back and forth and it lasted maybe 10 seconds and that was it. You can't really call that an earthquake, can you? Haggai talks about a time that is foreseen also in the book of Revelation when the whole world is going to shake. There will be the birth pangs of the Messiah before Jesus returns. That's the God of heaven and earth. He makes it and he can shake it. He is sovereign over it. So which eyes are more important? Which names are more important? The names of Tatnai the governor? Or the name of the great God who is the God of heaven? He is also called in this passage uh, Elohim, the Lord, whose house is in Jerusalem. Nine times in the text, we're not going to retrace them. You can do that yourself. And Tatanai has referred to him as the God who has his house in Jerusalem. It's a little humorous, isn't it? As if the God of the Jews has to have a house. But that's a typically pagan way of looking at things. They see God as being so small. He has a little building where he's worshipped. But of course, the Old Testament tells us that the temple that Solomon built and the um, the temple that replaced it, the Temple of Zerubbabel, was just a little footstool for the God who fills the whole world, who fills its universe. And it was unique. And God is building a house today, as we've said earlier, his church, his temple, and he fills, he fills his people all around the world. It is greater than a nation, it is greater than global government, it is certainly greater than a nuclear family. The God of the heaven and earth 
fills his house today. That's tremendous. Amen. And the other name that is used in conclusion is the name, uh, the, the, the God who has made his name to dwell there. Chapter 6, verse 12. The God that hath caused his name to dwell there in Jerusalem should destroy all kings and people who try to oppose this practice. God had caused his name to dwell in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount. It was his decision, and that made that location on the earth absolutely unique. And the uniqueness of that place on the Temple Mount caused God to guide Darius to do these amazing things that you find in his letter. Seek for the legal documents, first of all, even though they were a long ways away from the capital city of Babylon. They were in Ekbatana, in Media. It was a warehouse far to the north. Look for the memorandum. Number two, I'm going to warn the enemies of God away from interfering in the project. Number three, you guys are going to pay for the project, as Cyrus has decreed, with taxes from the immediate region. Don't expect the, the, uh, the King Darius and his bureaucracy on the other side of the Euphrates to pay for this on your side of the Euphrates, you guys are going to have to dig up the taxes from your own funds. Number four, act without delaying tactics. We don't want any bureaucratic red tape. Number five, make daily provisions for the needed sacrificial animals. This is going to be a huge financial commitment for the surrounding Gentile nations. They're going to finance the Jews' project. And oh, by the way, number six, we would like these people to pray for the king and his royal family. We want those Jews down there in the house that God has chosen to place his name there to pray for Darius I and the whole royal family of the Medo-Persian Empire. And oh, just a few other details. I menace you with dire punishment if you violate the decree. Any violators will be impaled on a timber drawn from their own houses. What profound humiliation that would be. And their houses will become a rubbish heap. There is more graphic language used in the text. So the inheritance of the children is lost, and they can start life all over. And he prays that the God of heaven, who has set up his house in Jerusalem, would overthrow any people or, ruling, or ruler seeking to change Cyrus's and Darius's decree. Isn't that an amazing result? I, I wonder what Zerubbabel and Yeshua the priest thought when they knew that that letter was going to go to the fat cats in the capital of the Medo-Persian Medo Empire. That there is a sense of intimidation. We're going to we're going to get you guys and we're going to use all the legal means in our hand to defeat you. And what came back in the answer was just a, a, a complete negation. In fact, it is what, like the, the psalm that we read earlier. The, the enemies of God were caught in their own trap. Not only were they now in the clear that the Jews had to finish the project, but they were going to have to finance it. If God has caused his name to dwell in his church today, don't you think that when we are intimidated, we need to keep going? Amen. What has God called us to do, no matter what others may say? Acts 15, 14 says that God has called out today from among the Gentiles a, the Gentiles, a people for his name. And the name of God hasn't changed. He is still the great God. He is the God of heaven and earth. He is the God who has caused his name to dwell in Jerusalem. He is the God who is building his church. He's fulfilling his program. Back in 1969, at a little high school graduation ceremony, well, it wasn't a little. It wasn't a little one, really. There were many people in the graduating class, close to a thousand. 
there was a time when graduation speeches had to be given. And the people who were in charge of that class picked out four individuals in the graduating class and said, we want you to give speeches. And so I was one of those. There were a couple of others, two girls and two guys. And with the encouragement of my parents, I decided it would be a good thing to come up with a short speech about the need to return to moral integrity and to state in that my belief that this could only be really achieved by trust in Jesus Christ. The rules were, once the speech was written, we had to give it to our English teacher to look at. My English teacher was a little Jewish lady who was tough as nails. This is Baumgartner. She had a thick New York accent and a rough voice. She was a smoker. And she didn't cut anybody any slack. And she handed back the speech and she said, Mr. Hyde, Tim, this is not going to work. <laughs> There's lots of Jewish people in the audience that are going to be really offended. I said, I'd like to speak to my guidance counselor about that. So I took the speech to the guidance counselor. And she said, uh, yeah, I think Mrs. Baumgartner is probably right. I don't think you should put in that part there about Jesus. That's kind of offensive. And so I decided I'd go to the vice president, who was responsible for our particular class. And I appealed to him and said, could I just go ahead and give the address as planned? He said, uh, I don't know. Let's give it to the principal of the high school. And so the day before the actual ceremony, the principal of the high school, who had redlined all of the four speeches, gave mine back to me. And there was a very obvious red line crossing out any reference to Jesus Christ. And uh, when he was finished speaking to us, I went up to him and I said, Dr. King, you know, my friend here, Jeff Vey, is going to make an, just a vicious attack against American policy about the Vietnam War. He is going to make some very critical comments. And you're allowing him to speak his mind. Why wouldn't you let me speak my mind? As it turned out, I was able to give that speech. And I was a little nervous about it, not just a little. Because it was all stadium with people listening, and I thought I'm going to get myself into heat of trouble here. As it turned out, there was much more positive response to that than anything else. But I asked myself the question, what would I have done if there had been a menace <coughs> of violence? <coughs> What if somebody had said, you say those words, and we're going to plant a bomb in a place? Or we're going to take an AK-47 and shoot you dead? We've been to the point in our culture, we're way past 1969, when the cost, the, the weight of the threat of intimidation is far more intense. And I think that the people back there in this situation felt that a lot more than a little teenage kid trying to make a public stand of allegiance for Christ. I would have never have been able to do that without the Lord's help and the support of my parents. And we can't stand in the face of intimidation, any of us, in our various situations, unless we have God's help and one another's encouragement. We need that. And maybe the day's going to come when our assembly here is going to face some much more public opposition. If that happens, maybe I should say when that happens, we need to remember the eye of God that is upon us and the names of God. He is the great God. 
He is the God of heaven and earth. He is the God who caused his name to dwell in a certain place and to carry through a project to its completion. He didn't abandon those Jewish people. He will not abandon us. When intimidation comes, we ask God to help us stand our ground and we carry on serving him. That's what we ought to do. Now let's pray for one another in these days that we will do it. It's very easy to stand up here in a safe place and talk about this. See this afternoon. But in the trenches, right, when we go out into this week, our commitment to these principles will be tested. May God help us to deal with peril by having confidence when we're face to face with the enemy. Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture. It's, it's something we tend to uh, skip over in our Bible reading, maybe because it seems just a little bit irrelevant, but we see these dynamics involved. And they're just the same kinds of things that we deal with in our lives. So help us in the face of intimidation to be faithful to you, to lean upon you, to remember that your eye watches us and that your names are great because you are great and that you stand behind us day by day. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.